Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship today. I'm Pastor Hay from WLA and Final Act. It's my pleasure to be with you again. I see so many familiar faces from the many years that I've been here and to worship with you. The theme of worship this Lent has been rethinking religion, taking a look at so many places in the Bible where God challenges us to change our natural way of looking at things. And today the, the focus is on rethinking worship, thinking about why do we really worship God and, and striving to do it from our hearts. We begin our worship this morning with our opening hymn. <clears throat> ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with hymn 652, verses 1 and 2. Thank <laughs> you.
you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, the spirit to think and do what is right, that we, who cannot do anything that is good without you, may by your help be enabled to live according to your will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our first scripture lesson for this morning is the Ten Commandments, as it is recorded in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your, your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. This is the word of the Lord. And be to God. We continue with singing the Psalm one Psalm nineteen.
St. Paul's first letter to Corinthians, chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. The last part of uh, this evening will be the basis of our sermon later in our service. Paul wrote, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Or since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the singing of the gospel acclamation, which we find on the bottom of page 161. Remember that it is written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then responded to him, What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you are going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Congregation may be seated for our next hymn.
God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for us this morning is the last part of our second scripture lesson this morning from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, reading verses 22 through 25, where Paul wrote, Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. This is the word of our Lord. Dear friends, if you like to watch Time of Grace with Pastor Novotny, as I do, um, and you watched his message last Sunday, you heard that he said in his introduction that in 1980, nine out of 10 Americans self-identified as Christians. And today, it is six out of 10 Americans that, identify, that would say, yeah, I, I believe in Jesus and I'm trying to follow him in my life. In about 40 years, it's gone from 90% of Americans to about 60%. Of course, it's predicted that it's just going to keep going down. People who say that they accept Christianity. And obviously, that leads to the question, why? Why have so many people walked away from Christianity? Why are there so many people who do not even accept it in the first place? And there are probably a million reasons for that. But two of the most common are, first of all, that it just doesn't seem to make sense. You know, it, it doesn't seem logical, it's contrary to common sense, it seems contrary to science. And the second is that it's just, it just seems kind of weak. It just needs more proof. You're going to ask me to believe in an invisible God, with an invisible Savior, in an invisible heaven. I need, can you show me something that proves me that these things are real, and they are true. <clears throat> It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, writing in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2,000 years ago, addressed these two objections to the Christian faith. Again, the theme in church this, during this Lent season is that God wants us to rethink things. Maybe the way we naturally look at things is, is not really right. And that's the point Paul's making in these verses. He, he, he calls our attention to the heart and core of the Christian religion, which is Jesus' death on the cross for our sins and for our salvation. And he points out, yeah, that doesn't really make sense. It's foolish in the, to the logical mind. And maybe it seems kind of weak and could use more proof. But that message ultimately turns things around turns things on their head, because even though it may seem foolish, it is wiser than any human wisdom, and even though it may seem weak, it is stronger than any human strength. So, in these words that we look at, Paul is talking about two different groups of people. First of all, people that he had a lot of contact with. First of all, Greek people. The Greeks were famous back then, they're still famous today, for Celebrating wisdom for being really smart in the sense of wise, in, in the sense of insightful. People like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, we've all heard those names, right? And these were people that were really smart and then they observed life and they observed human interactions and they came up with a lot of wise observations of life and a lot of insights onto how a person should live their life. And, and the Greeks of Bible times, they, they celebrated this, this kind of thinking. Paul was writing these words to people in Corinth, which was in Greece. These were Greek people that Paul was writing to. The ancient writer Aristides once wrote that in Corinth, the people that Paul was writing to, in Corinth, on every street corner, there was a wise man who had the solutions to all of the world's problems. Sounds to me kind of like the internet today. <laughs> I think that we modern Americans can identify with the way that the Greek people of Bible times thought, this, this admiration for this, this love of wisdom. 
People, I mean, how do people make a cell phone? <laughs> the intelligence required to invent a cell phone and to perfect cell phone technology and all of the advances that we have, that we see and that we know in the medical field and in transportation, the intelligence that some people have, we, most of us are just in awe of that, aren't we? That's, that's one kind of wisdom or intelligence. And of course, there's the wisdom of people that we think sort of have insights into life and into the problems of life. Why are there some Instagram influencers or TikTok influencers who have millions of followers? Why do some people, why are some people so devoted to their favorite commentator on Fox News or CNN or their favorite podcasts. Isn't it because we feel like these people know what they're talking about? These people are wise people who have insights into the world's problems. I think we can relate to what Paul's talking about. He says some people value wisdom. And of course, <clears throat> that's the way it's always been. How do such people tend to react to the gospel? The simple message of the Christian faith. Paul says, we preach Christ crucified foolishness to Greeks. The message of a Jewish carpenter hanging on a cross, and that's the solution to all your problems, just seemed ridiculous. Archaeologists have discovered uh, a piece of ancient graffiti in the ruins of Rome. Maybe you've heard this. There has been discovered a crude uh, drawing of a, a donkey hanging on a cross and a crude drawing of a man in front of the donkey on the cross with his hands upraised. And in Greek, remember Paul's talking about Greeks, in Greek underneath it it says Alexis worships his God. That's what the message of Christianity sounded like to the typical Greek mind. As foolish as worshiping a donkey on a cross. And have things changed that much down through the centuries? I don't know if you ever heard this, but Thomas Jefferson, who I think we would all you know, think of as a wise person, wrote the Declaration of Independence, was our third president, and you know, wrote a lot of things, and a lot of people look favorably upon him as the father, one of the fathers of our country. Thomas Jefferson once famously cut out of his own personal Bible all the parts that he thought were false. And that meant all the parts that were supernatural or miraculous. So Jesus walking on water, that got cut out, Jesus rising from the dead. The idea that Jesus is God, therefore, pays for our sins. Moses parting the Red Sea, that all got cut out, leaving, of course, only a fraction of the Bible because it did not make sense to his rational mind. This foolishness. And Paul is saying here in these words, yeah, to the human mind, the message of a Jewish carpenter hanging on a cross solves all your problems for all eternity, and <laughs> does seem foolish. But... Remember, God wants us to rethink things. The cross turns things on their head. It is foolish, but it's foolishness that's wiser than anything, any wisdom that human beings can come up with. What did we come up with? You'll be happy if you work hard and make lots of money and have money in your bank account and your retirement accounts. You'll be happy. <clears throat> We live in the most affluent society in the history of the world, by far. And what does study after study after study tell us? That more people than ever are depressed, more people than ever are anxious and struggle with their mental health, and more people are unhappy than ever before. Maybe just your conversations with the people you know already uh, tells them that. <clears throat> what kind of wisdom does the world come up with? Find happiness in pleasure, in your entertainments. Whether that's hunting or fishing or skiing or watching old movies or, you know, whatever it is that brings you happiness, that, that's your happiness. And of course there is 
those are all can be blessings from God, <clears throat> just like money can be. But sooner or later, every pleasure, every entertainment gets old and it gets boring and it becomes commonplace, and we gotta have either more of it or we gotta find something new, and it's just an endless chasing of the wind, as Solomon said in the book of Ecclesiastes. How about learning? How about education? Just satisfy your intellectual curiosity. Try to learn as much as you can until you day, the day you die. Of course, there is some truth to that as well. There's value in constantly learning, of course. But experience tells us that often the most educated people are the most cynical and the most unhappy people you could ever find. I'm going to guess you already know this. Isn't true happiness found in eternal things? Isn't real peace in your heart? Doesn't that come from knowing what's going to happen to you when you die? Knowing that you have a God who loves you with an eternal love, a Savior who loves you so much he was willing to go to a cross and suffer for you so that when your money and your pleasures and your learning and everything else is gone, you will be welcomed into a place where you will be happy forever? Isn't that where true happiness lies? <clears throat> Even though that doesn't make sense to the human mind, that is foolishness. That is much wiser than any wisdom we could ever come up with. And the second point Paul makes is that even though the, the, the heart and core of Christianity <clears throat> may be weak, it is weakness that is stronger than human strength. The second group of people that Paul talked about were Jewish people. Of course, Jesus, the Bible was mostly about Jewish people, the, the chosen people of God. Jesus was a Jew. Paul was a Jew. And the first thing that Paul says about them <coughs> is that Jews demand signs. they got to have proof. We read it before in our gospel lesson. One of the many times where Jesus was doing something and some Jewish people came up to him and said, Can you give us a sign? to prove to us that you have authority to do this, or can you give us a sign to prove to us that you are who you say you are, which was ridiculous, of course, because what did Jesus do? He did miracle after miracle, and still people did not believe in him. Why not? Because no one's ever brought to faith because they saw a miracle. People are only brought to faith through the quiet power of God's word. I should probably know from the Bible, from the book of Acts, when Paul went out on his missionary journeys to spread the message of Jesus, the Savior, to as many people as possible. Almost all the time, when he came to a new town, the first place he went was to the Jewish synagogue. His own people. The people who had the Old Testament Bible and supposedly were looking forward to a Savior. And Paul was going to tell them about that Savior. What happened? Paul says, We preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews. It just seemed a little too weak. <clears throat> the message of a guy who gets pushed around, who's at the mercy of people who are more powerful than him, that just didn't seem very attractive. So Paul should just wash his hands of them, right? People who thought that Christianity is foolish and, and too weak. He said, no, <clears throat> because even though it is weak or seems weak to human beings, it is weakness that is stronger than human strength. God, of course, is the strongest being ever, right? You know, he made the universe. He holds the universe together with his almighty power. He made us, keeps us breathing, keeps us alive with his almighty power. His power is beyond our imagination, his strength, that we can't even conceive of it. And yet, as God was doing the most powerful thing he would ever do, which was getting you and me into heaven, saving the whole world of all time, as God was doing the most powerful thing that anyone ever did, he looked as weak as a dish rack as Jesus allowed himself to be arrested and pushed around and poked and whipped and beat and spit on and mocked and ultimately nailed to a cross. 
But while he was doing that, he was doing the strongest thing, the most powerful thing that anyone had ever did. Human beings, of course, can be very strong. <clears throat> For those of us that like sports, I think that's one of the reasons why we like sports. You watch the Olympics, you watch professional sports, you can see that human beings do things with their body that are just amazing and, and therefore very fascinating and, and entertaining. <clears throat> but could the strongest gymnast, could the beefiest offensive lineman, could the most muscular professional wrestler muscle their way into heaven, beat the devil, muscle their way past God when they die? Obviously, it's ridiculous. Only the weak-looking Jesus hanging on a cross can do that. So yes, my friends, the heart and core of what we believe is foolish to the world, also foolish to our own natural mind. Weak to the world, sometimes maybe even seems a little weak, we'd like a little more proof ourselves. But it's what gets us into heaven. That makes it pretty smart, right? And that makes it pretty strong. May we always cling to the message of Jesus in his cross for our own strength, for our own comfort in this life. And may we never be frightened, may we never be intimidated, may we never be hesitant to share that message with other people who need to hear it. Amen. Please rise. <clears throat>
Remember those who suffer persecution for the faith. Have mercy on those for whom death draws near. Grant them your love and take them into your tender care. Hear us, Lord, as we pray in silence. We remember with thanksgiving those who have loved and served you, who now rest from their labors. Console those who are mourning or living with sadness. Keep us in true faith and bring us at last to the joys of heaven. Grant us these things, Father, for the sake of Jesus, who died and rose again. Amen. We continue with the offering. We rise for prayer. We conclude our service on page 171, also the words on the screen. <clears throat> Blessed Lord, you have given us your holy scriptures for our learning. May we so hear them, read, learn, and take them to heart, that being strengthened and comforted by your holy word, we may cling to the blessed hope of everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Congregation may be seated for our final meeting.
Pastor Zebo didn't share with me any announcements that were to be made. Unless there are announcements that <coughs> from the floor. Then we will close by watching this month's edition of the Wells Connection. to those who know their Savior and to those who don't yet know Him. And by the grace of God, Wells Home Mission churches around our synod continue to do just that as we enter year two of planting 100 new mission churches and enhancing 75 existing ministries over the next decade. Dan and Savannah Sheffel are new Wells members in Fredericksburg, Virginia. But prior to that, they were no strangers to Christianity. We grew up in a church, I served in a church my whole life. Before coming to a Wells church, they both served on their local church's staff until a few years ago, when their church experienced some internal problems that led Dan and Savannah to leave behind both their work, community, and their church family at the same time. It was lonely, and we had moved here for that church, and leaving there, that was our community, that was our friends, that was the whole reason we lived in Virginia and left our families. Um, and it was, it was isolating, and you know, how do you stay close to God when you're leaving a place where you should have been growing closer to Him, but you felt further and further away. Thanks to a simple invitation from a friend, and the work of the Holy Spirit, Dan and Savannah were led to visit the Wells Home Mission Church in their area, the Way Lutheran Church. Would you join me in our confession centered around a remembrance of our baptism in your worship guide? The Way has been worshiping in rented spaces since it launched seven years ago, and now they are putting down roots by buying and renovating a building of their own. It's so easy as you grow as a church to maybe get a little distracted with our capital campaign, our building project, our first church. And so we remind ourselves all the time, keep the main thing the main thing, which means holding out the mission that Christ gave the church, sharing the gospel with our community continually, and gathering ourselves around it. And the way's emphasis on the main thing was exactly what Dan and Savannah needed. One thing that surprised me when I sat down with Dan and Savannah was really their passionate interest in our church body. They wanted to ask about our doctrine of fellowship and just how that plays out in real terms. That's the way the sacraments are valued and treated within the Lutheran Church. It's definitely refreshing. Close communion was an entirely new concept for me. I had never heard of it. <laughs> and I had to read a book about it. But it means something. It's not just something we do quarterly and everybody wears a suit that Sunday. It's, we need this. This is God's forgiveness. And how great is it to partake in that? It's not just a tradition we do because Jesus did it with his disciples and told us to do it. This is meaningful. This is healing. This is forgiveness. Through the Way's Bible information class, the Lord opened Dan and Savannah's eyes to what the Bible says about salvation by grace through faith in Christ. The Lord's Supper. Christian marriage, and infant baptism. This new biblical understanding of baptism led them to baptize their baby girl, Ingrid. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It was so meaningful, and it just, it felt like full circle, because, you know, 2019, we felt so lost. I didn't know if we'd ever find a church that felt like home, and that was truly teaching God's Word. And there we were, all these years later. Dan and Savannah have since moved back to their hometown in Pennsylvania to be closer to family. And they say that they've had a difficult time finding a new church home there, since there isn't a Wells Church in the area. We really want to have um, a, a Wells Church in our community that can be there to serve 
and be a light and be a um, home to the families where we live. In fact, they have been so impacted by their experience at The Way that they have started to ask about how they can get involved with Wells Home Missions in their community. If there was an opportunity for a core group to form and for us to plant a church in downtown Johnstown where we live, we would absolutely love that. The initiative to plant 100 new home mission churches and enhance 75 existing congregations by 2033 continues to be moving forward by the grace of God. At wells110.net, you can see more stories of individual souls who are being impacted by Wells Home Missions, as well as learn about how you can be a part of this effort.